Hey guys, it's Ryan at GPI. We're going to roll into our next segment of our GPI knowledge series. And today we are going to talk about some basics of induction setup, or at least from our perspective, things we look for when we're setting up a, your induction system for your particular combination. A few uh, abbreviations you'll see in here are going to be TB, which is slang for throttle body, CAI, which is going to be your cold air intake, IM, which is going to be your intake manifold, and CSA, which is going to be cross-sectional area. The first thing that we look at, or one of the most crucial things, is going to be your air intake setup. And just think of it uh, almost like a straw. I mean, that's what feeds your engine, uh, connects the, uh, the filter to the throttle body. So... If the cold air intake is smaller or the same size as your throttle body you are running, you run a, a very high risk of having a restriction uh, in your induction system before the throttle body. So maybe your throttle body isn't the limiting factor of your airflow. Um, maybe you have a 102 throttle body, and which is approximately four inches in diameter, and you have a four inch air intake pipe, and you think, well, it's four inches, so I don't have a restriction. But if that pipe is two feet long, it acts like a straw. So it's not like having an open four inch pipe. So you just need to keep that in mind, especially when, when guys are making higher horsepower, uh, turning higher RPMs, even these small cubic inch engines like the LT1 and LS3, you know, your 6.2 liter stuff, um, can starve with a four inch induction pipe uh, at some point if it's making enough power and the engine is consuming enough air. So that's one of the main things to think about in, in induction design. And honestly, most of the shelf options are not gonna be 100% geared around a performance application. They are going to increase performance versus your factory air box, but that doesn't mean it's going to pro provide maximum performance when we really uh, ring these builds out making you know, 500 plus, 600 plus rear wheel naturally aspirated. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later on why we run some of the induction setups, but that's that's one of the main reasons because a lot of times uh, factory options that are three and a half to the four inch diameter range uh, just won't provide enough airflow for the things we do on the higher horsepower application builds. Uh, the next thing is going to be the throttle body itself. Um, and essentially the area inside the throttle body is going to dictate ultimately how much air flow that you're going to have available for the engine. Um, there's really not a penalty at all for having a bigger throttle body on your engine or on your manifold uh, as long as that it's not over ported and I'll talk about that a little bit in a second uh, and as long as it doesn't provide too much air flow uh, abruptly at lower uh, throttle positions so you know one thing that can happen is is like on the LT platform the 95 millimeter throttle body is very very popular because it's very cost effective and it flows a, a fair amount of air and more often than not when those get ported they get over ported um, and what you end up with is a, is a weird scenario where uh, because of GM's torque command uh, in the electronic control module, you end up with inconsistent um, throttle opening and uh, surging because it has too much airflow at too small of a blade um, percentage or throttle pedal input, and it causes some drivability issues. At wide open throttle, it's not an issue, but it does cause some drivability concerns. Um, the quality 102 throttle bodies or 103 millimeter throttle bodies like we use, uh, the Nick Williams and the K-Tech throttle bodies, they have a ton of airflow, um, but they're designed properly to where at lower blade uh, positions, it's not too much airflow and it doesn't freak the computer out. Uh, drivability is better. Idle quality is about like stop. And obviously you have the, the ultimate airflow when you have the, the larger throttle bore. Um, you do not need a small throttle body um, just enough to, to, to get your engine uh, airflow needs. 
control. Anytime we have dyno tested or track tested a larger throttle body, um, if there has been any restriction in the intake manifold whatsoever, uh, even if it helped just a little bit, it's always gone faster. Even if sometimes it doesn't show much, um, it, they have always picked up a little bit. So there's, there's no pen penalty in terms of power for having a big throttle body on a fuel injected engine. Um, it's not going to hurt you. It only stands to be able to help you. And, you know, one of the ways that we use to, uh, to identify do we have an inlet restriction is simply by reading the map sensor data on the data log. Uh, we read it in, in the metric uh, format, which is going to be KPA. And essentially, KPA, uh, 100 KPA approximately at key on without the engine running is atmospheric pressure. So at wide open throttle, when you're making a log and you're ripping, you'll notice a lot of times at lower RPM, your MAP KPA reading will be, you know, that 98, 99 range. And then when you get to higher RPMs, you'll see that thing fade off to 94, 95, or 96, somewhere around in there. And that is letting you know that there's an inlet restriction. And the way to fix that is to identify that problem area and... Um, and fix it. And it could be anything from air intake to the throttle body to the intake manifold itself. But that is going to be uh, what you want to look at to determine do you have an inlet restriction and do you stand to gain anything by addressing that. So throttle body, we've never seen it go backwards by putting a th larger throttle body on there. Um, if the manifold will handle it and it matches up good to the manifold inlet, um, go for it. Uh, it, it will only stand to help you, especially as you grow with, with your combination and power, you know, demand goes up. The next area is going to be intake manifold. The intake manifold itself, uh, there's a lot of detail that goes into a, um, a nice intake manifold, not only from design and manufacturing, but uh, for us as an installer, uh, and builder when we put the intake manifold on there's some details some things we look for so a properly designed manifold will have a really nice plenum uh, which is going to include not just the design or shape of the plenum but the volume of the plenum you know it needs enough volume in there uh, to be able to feed your engine at high rpm and there are a lot of opinions a lot of uh, myths about works well um, for plenum volume and size. This is another area where on electronic fuel injection, I personally have not ran into an issue where I went larger with the plenum and I lost power. I have not seen that happen. Uh, not with the manifolds that are readily available at least. So as a matter of fact, we can take a, a Holly High Ram manifold and we can put a one inch plenum, uh, a lid spacer on there to give us that much more plenum volume and we pick up horsepower through the entire curve um, on a approximate 600 rear wheel horsepower setup. And that's just from testing that you know, specific setup. It, it picks up on the bolt-on cars as well. Um, but that's just to give you an example of how we have tested plenum volume and not seen a negative effect. We didn't see a loss of low end only to gain in the top end. We just flat out picked up power everywhere, you know, in our test range, which was probably 3,500 to, you know, 7,500 or so. Uh, the next design aspect is going to be the runner length, uh, the cross-section area, and the taper. And those are huge uh, influences on what the manifold is going to want for engine RPM. Where is this thing going to perform RPM-wise on a given combination? Um, you know, a good manifold, you'll always find that the cross-section area, which is the area of the, of the runner itself, is going to be larger at the plenum, and it's going to taper down smaller towards the cylinder head. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like a funnel. And there are also a lot of opinions, and uh, everybody does something a little different there. And I'm not saying that one person's right and one person's wrong. There's several different ways to get there. Uh, for what you're trying to do. Um, but 
you know, you don't ever want to do any porting to the manifold that's going to mess the taper up and make just a straight, you know, runner out of it. Um, so that, that's one thing to look at in regards to taper and the cross section. Uh, you can get too big with cross section area on a small engine. Uh, it's completely unnecessary and, and it will, it can, uh, you know, slow down the velocity of the air from the testing we've done. And we have seen some negative uh, effects from that. Um, a, a prime example would be for the LT manifold, the Holly High Ram. Uh, the cross section area is huge on this thing right out of the box. It doesn't really need to be much bigger than what it is uh, mathematically for the kind of power those engines make and for the RPM they turn. So you have to be careful with that and not overdo it, but that is another one of the design aspects of manifolds. And then obviously runner length, which is a huge one. I mean, that one, that alone is one of the huge factors in what makes each manifold perform at different RPM ranges. Your plastic low profile manifolds will have longer runners uh, and they lay over sideways. They're more compact. Uh, they can't go vertically, so they lay these things over sideways. Um, you know, the, the MSD manifold has shorter runners than the LT2 manifold. The LT2 has a little bit shorter runner than the factory LT1 manifold. And then the Holly High Ram, of course, has the shortest manifold runners of anything that's currently available right now. Um, and it's, the runners come in, I think somewhere around the neighborhood of six and a quarter inches or so. I'd have to measure one of those to, to know exactly. I get the LS and LT mixed up, but they're all, in that six to six and a half inch runner uh, runner length range on the Holly high rim manifolds. Um, our CID manifold um, that John's coming out with will be something a little bit different. It's going to be um, a little bit different than anything else on the market in regards of uh, how it's designed and we're excited uh, to get our hands on that and test that. Um, but you know, that's, that's the things we look for in the intake manifold from a design aspect is the details. Runner length, this cross section area look pretty good for what we're trying to do. Is this thing, the taper look pretty good, which most of the time, most of these manifolds are designed pretty well. I mean, they're, they're pretty good out of the box. Now more on the detail part. When we go to put a combination together, the heads may be milled, they may be ported. Uh, the port alignment may be it may be a raised port head where we've moved the port up in the head a little bit uh, versus a stock location. Uh, the heads may be milled where the heads sit lower on the block, so now the port alignment is not right. Maybe uh, there, there's just there's a lot of variables when you're putting a combination together that you need to consider. So when you set the manifold on there and you look down through the runner, if it doesn't line up with the port perfectly, there's power left on the table. You, you never want any steps down at the head. You don't want any misalignment side to side or vertically um, on the, the port to the runner of the manifold. Sometimes that's gonna require port matching of the manifold um, to get the sizing right um, and blend that in so you don't just completely destroy your taper in your runner. And sometimes that's gonna require milling of the intake manifold flange to bring that manifold height down to line up vertically with the ports. And we run into that more than we do anything probably. So I can tell you from my personal experience, my stop bottom end LS3 setup, I tested three different CID intake manifolds and a Holly high ram with twin uh, four barrel throttle bodies on it. And I took the best performing intake manifold out of the box, which ended up being the CID with the largest cross section area um, for my combo that went well into the 8,000s. And we looked and alignment was a little bit off um, on, the, on the ports on my heads because I had a small port LS7 head we had developed. And we did nothing besides pull the manifold off while it was still on the engine dyno and corrected the alignment issues. We port matched it. And it picked up eight horsepower on the engine dyno just from making sure the ports were aligned perfectly versus it being out of the box and just having some uh, misalignment issues side to side 
on some of the ports. So it didn't take much, but that little detail work like that can really show up big for you when you're trying to, to make some numbers. All this little stuff, all these little details add up. And you guys need to be aware of that and look at that when you're putting your, your stuff together if you're working on it yourself. And make sure that you're not leaving anything on the table. It doesn't take much time often with that, uh, but it's something huge that can really uh, pay dividends. All right, now the last thing in terms that we get asked a lot on air induction, why do we run those velocity stacks? Why do we just ditch the cold air intake setup completely uh, and run a velocity stack right behind a, an opening in the hood? It's a lot on the six gens and some over the radiator stuff as well. And we've been doing over the radiator stuff on fifth gens for, you know, over 10 years. I mean, it's, that's nothing new really. But why do we do it? Well, it's, it's the most direct airflow path. Um, and when you can pick up air from behind a, an opening like in the hood on the Anderson composite hood on the sixth gen, it's fresh, cool air. Um, it's right there. There is no restriction. We take the straw out. We take the restriction out by putting the velocity stack in there. Uh, same thing when we build a pipe and we go over the radiator and put the airflow or the air filter or a velocity stack on the end of the tube in front of the radiator. We're getting a more direct airflow path that's in front of all the heat. It's in front of the radiator. It's out of the engine bay. So we start with a cooler air charge right off the bat. Um, these setups when can show some other gains. So when you're going down track and you've got a car that's trapping, let's say 140, 130 miles an hour, even 120 something, you can see on your map sensor on the log on these six gen cars that we do with the V stacks that we'll get a little bit of positive manifold pressure. We're actually getting a slight amount of ram air. Uh, now, what does that equate to power-wise? I can't tell you. I don't have a way to measure it. I can't simulate that on the, on the dyno, so I can't tell you. But our map reading will actually go over what atmospheric pressure is. And I've seen as much as a couple kPa, you know, 2 kPa. So it is worth something to have the most direct airflow path coolest air charge available uh, that that's always worth power so that's that's why we run the, the velocity stacks and the over the radiator stuff is because um it, it just simply is the most direct way to get the air and the coolest air to the engine also on the v stack it, you notice those things have a really large radius um, and that helps the airflow transition and roll into that induction system versus just having sharp cut edges on the end of a pipe. Uh, the large radius always helps the airflow uh, find its way in there. Um, and, you know, lastly, cooler air, it's, it's always worth more power, period. So that's one of the things I noticed when I had my fifth gen uh, several years back when I had the street driven setups where I would run the bare ram cold air intake. I had one of the side style air inductions on there. And one thing I always noticed at the track was it didn't matter how good of a job I did with keeping the hood up or trying to manage the heat. By the time I did my burnout and I staged, my air intake temps were always up about 20 degrees versus ambient temperature outside because your hood's down and you don't have any circulation of airflow and that is behind the radiator and it's kind of trapped in the engine bay. So, there's always a little bit of heat off of the line. And, you know, once you made it out past, you know, 60, 80, maybe 100 feet, you know, it would start to cool down. And, of course, at that point, you knew you were max power. Whereas when I went to the Vera Ram, I was able to start much cooler. I was, a, you know, I was able to manage the heat and keep the heat within, like, 8 to 10 degrees of ambient temp outside. And it cooled down much faster as soon as the car started moving because the air pickup point was in front of the radiator, right behind the grill opening. So this is just a little bit of a information about what we look for in air induction setup, how it can affect your combination and why it is worth power to uh, really focus on the detail work 
in every one of these aspects. It's, it's not just as simple as flipping open the catalog or going on the website and you know finding the, uh, the coolest looking air induction and buying that and throwing it on and it works because everybody said it works. You need to be detailed. Uh, hit us up, ask us about it. We've tested a lot of this stuff uh, despite us not really publishing a lot of detail. Uh, we always want to ensure that we put the best combination together for you guys. So lean on us for that information. And uh, as always, thanks for tuning in. Uh, let us know in the comments below what you think about the videos. Uh, leave us some feedback, subscribe, and like. Thanks, guys.